revealing the new move. Even if you test negative for the flu, you will still be tested for coronavirus in those cities. We have the list and our interview tonight with the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the anxious flight from the U.S. to the U.K. The pilot reportedly revealing there could be a passenger with coronavirus on the flight and what happened next. The verdict is in tonight. The lawyer who took on President Trump, who represented Stormy Daniels. Tonight, Michael Avenatti convicted of extortion in a separate case. He could now face 42 years in prison. The chilling turn tonight after that little girl just six. The last images of her on the school bus found dead. Also discovered the body of a man in the same neighborhood and what authorities are now revealing. The dangerous Arctic blast moving into the east major cities this weekend. Wind chills below zero in some places. We track it. Tonight, new questions as the Justice Department now opens a new probe into the handling of the Michael Flynn case, one of the president's earliest advisors. And it comes amid criticism the president applied pressure on the Justice Department in the Roger Stone case. The attorney general denying that in our ABC News interview. The major development that could affect thousands of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, Martha Raddatz standing by. The college football player under arrest. Video showing him lifting a police officer over his head, allegedly body slamming him. And the Valentine's Day surprise, the moment that had everyone moved. Who is our person of the week? This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a very busy Friday night, and we begin tonight with the coronavirus emergency. This evening, the CDC now revealing new measures being taken right here in the U.S. Today, we learned Americans in five major cities who have flu-like symptoms will also be tested for coronavirus, even if their flu tests are negative. It's a preemptive strike against the virus here at home, and it all comes amid increasing global alarm. In fact, today, passengers on a flight from the U.S. to the U.K. leaving from San Francisco were told by the pilot someone on board might have coronavirus. One passenger says they were told to stay in their seats. It was never confirmed, but it was certainly alarming. And tonight, China now revealing the virus has sickened more than 1,700 medical workers on the front lines. Six have died. They are also now expanding mass roundups to contain the virus to include people who might have coronavirus, not just confirmed cases. ABC's Maggie Ruley leads us off from Japan tonight with news on that cruise ship with Americans on board and news on those tests in five major U.S. cities. Tonight, a scare on this United Airlines jet landing in London. The captain announced that the person had a suspected case of uh, the coronavirus and that we were all to keep in our seats. All 251 passengers were released, but it's just the latest false alarm for already jittery travelers. Experts at home say the virus could last into next year. We want people to understand we likely will see more cases here in the United States. To combat the spread, the U.S. announcing it will now be testing for COVID-19 in five major cities in cases where flu tests were negative in Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York. Individuals who present with flu-like symptoms will also be tested for the China coronavirus. This will give us an early warning system of further spread in the United States. In China, a wartime campaign to stop the virus after cracking down on patients violating quarantine rules. Now, home fever checks and a mass roundup of people who could have the virus. Then tonight, we're getting our first look at the toll on the front lines of this fight. China revealing more than 1,700 of its medical workers have contracted the virus and six have died. Doctors there begging for more masks. Scientists from Hong Kong are out with a new video showing how to make your own. In Japan, the first passengers allowed off that cruise ship for quarantine on land. 11 guests have chosen to be disembarked. So far, more than 200 passengers have tested positive. We've been following John and Melanie Herring all week as he battled a high fever. Today, he tested positive for the virus. I'm alone here in the room, and uh, I would rather be back on the cruise ship. We have been following his story for days. We are all thinking about uh, him and his wife and Maggie back with us from that port in Japan. We know the CDC has tried to get a team on the ground in China for weeks now. You reported to us earlier today it looks like that could happen in the next few days. But Maggie, back here at home in the news here that the CDC says they'll test here in the U.S. all part of a preemptive strike. 
Yeah, David, the Secretary of Health and Human Services tells us that they're going to start this testing out of an abundance of caution. And again, it's happening in those five major cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York. Again, this is a precautionary tale. They're trying to stop the wave of this outbreak from happening here in the U.S. David. Maggie Rooley, who's been on this for days for us. Maggie, thank you. We turn next this Friday night to the guilty verdict for Michael Avenatti, the lawyer who took on President Trump. Tonight, he's now facing decades behind bars in a separate case. Avenatti convicted of a plot to extort millions from Nike. He's best known for representing Stormy Daniels in her lawsuit against President Trump. But tonight, he is a convicted felon at ABC Stephanie Ramos outside that New York City courtroom. Tonight, an epic fall for Michael Avenatti, the brash celebrity attorney now facing years in prison after a federal jury found him guilty of trying to extort the apparel giant Nike. His attorney vowing to fight. We have appellate rights that we're going to exercise, so you should expect an appeal. But prosecutors calling Avenatti's scheme a, quote, old-fashioned shakedown, where he threatened to hurt Nike's reputation and stock price unless the company paid him up to $25 million. Avenatti told Nike he had a client, a coach, who had damaging information about alleged Nike payments to the families of young athletes. At trial, prosecutors playing wiretapped phone calls. Avenatti threatening in one call, I'll go take $10 billion off your company's value. I'm not expletive around. But Nike had already turned to the FBI, and Avenatti was arrested. Through it all, proclaiming his innocence. I will be fully exonerated, and justice will be done. Avenatti still facing charges for defrauding other clients of millions of dollars, Stormy. including the one who made him famous, adult film star Stormy Daniels. Avenatti allegedly pocketing $300,000 from her book advance. He's pleaded not guilty. Stephanie Ramos with us live tonight outside federal court. And Stephanie Avenatti remains in custody, we know, until sentencing. And as I mentioned there a moment ago, uh, he now potentially faces decades behind bars. That's right, David. Avenatti in this case could face up to 42 years in prison, and he still has those two other trials this spring. If also convicted in those cases, he could face some serious time. David. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you as well. And we are learning more tonight after that six-year-old girl, Faye Swetlick, was found in South Carolina. She vanished from her front yard on Monday after getting off the school bus. Her body found in a nearby wooded area. Police had also revealed they also found the body of a man in the neighborhood and what they're now revealing about that tonight. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Tonight, a mother's heart-wrenching call for help. Lexington County 911. Please report a missing child. Six-year-old Faye Swetlick disappeared from her front yard Monday afternoon. We can't find my daughter. She was playing outside. And now I can't find her. I was not The three-day search coming to a tragic end Thursday morning when Faye was found dead. Authorities were following the garbage collection route throughout the neighborhood, methodically looking for clues. Investigators saying the break in the case came when they found an item belonging to Faye inside a neighbor's trash can. It was a critical piece of evidence that would have been listed on her missing persons flyer. Minutes later, police finding little Faye's body in a wooded area about 100 yards from her home in Casey, South Carolina. We believe that Faye had not been in that location for a very long time. Police identifying the neighbor as 30-year-old Cody Taylor, saying he was found dead inside his home shortly after police found Faye's body. Investigators did not say how they both died. Our evidence and our investigation does link these two together. I can confirm that he was a neighbor, that he was not a relative, he was not a friend. Tonight, this tight-knit town's pain on full display, this growing memorial in Faye's honor. And Marcus Moore with us tonight. And Marcus, I know you're learning more about the man whose body was recovered. David, police say 30-year-old Cody Taylor had no criminal history. He was unknown to law enforcement. Investigators actually talked to him after Faye disappeared. They even went into his home before making that tragic discovery. And tonight, police say they could release more information about that cause of death in the next day or two. David. Just an awful story all week long here. Marcus, thank you. And next to new questions tonight as the Justice Department now opens a new probe into the handling of the Michael Flynn case, one of the president's earliest advisors. It, of course, comes amid criticism the president applied pressure on the Justice Department in the Roger Stone case. 
The Attorney General denying that in our ABC News interview and Terry Moran tonight with these new developments from the White House. Attorney General Bill Barr already accused of doing a favor for President Trump by recommending a lighter sentence for the president's friend Roger Stone. And tonight we've learned Barr has ordered a review of the case of another close Trump ally, the president's first national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Well, I feel badly for General Flynn. I feel very badly. The news comes just a day after the attorney general, in an extraordinary rebuke, told the president... It's time to stop the tweeting about Department of Justice criminal cases. Trump was back on Twitter, insisting that while he's never directly intervened in a case, this doesn't mean that I do not have, as president, the legal right to do so. I do, but I have so far chosen not to. So far. In his interview with ABC News, Attorney General Bill Barr warned that Trump's railing about specific cases, saying who should or should not be investigated and prosecuted, is undermining Barr's credibility and the rule of law. To have public statements and tweets made about the department, uh, about uh, our people in the department, our, our men and women here, about cases pending in the department, and about judges before whom we have cases, uh, make it impossible uh, for me to do my job. One frequent Trump target, former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, under investigation for two years for allegedly lying to investigators about a leak to the media. Trump tweeting that McCabe was part of an illegal and treasonous plot, ripping into him again and again while he was being investigated. I think it's a disaster. And what he was trying to do was terrible. Today, the prosecutors in the case announced that McCabe will not face any charges, and McCabe fired back. It is an absolute disgrace that they took two years um, and put my family through this experience for two years before they finally drew the obvious conclusion um, and one they could have drawn um, a, a long, long time ago. A federal judge looking at the case was troubled, too. Court transcripts released today show him comparing the investigation of McCabe to something that happens in a banana republic and saying, I don't think people like the fact that you got somebody at the top basically trying to dictate whether somebody should be prosecuted. All right, so let's get to Terry Moran live at the White House. And Terry, we know the president not only has had a lot to say about the McCabe case, but about the prosecution of Michael Flynn as well. I want to get back to you reported at the top there. The attorney general's decision to review that case is now raising new questions of potentially improper influence tonight. Inevitably, David, uh, Michael Flynn, Trump's first national security advisor, he pleaded guilty to lying to investigators. He tried to reverse that plea, accused prosecutors of misconduct. That went nowhere. And now the attorney general saying new prosecutors will step in to look at that case. Trump and Barr both say they don't talk about these cases. They insist there's no undue influence. But it looks like there might not need to be. They see these cases the same way, and it benefits the president. David? All right, Terry Moran at the White House. Terry, always good to have you. And now to what could be a new deal in Afghanistan tonight. The U.S. and the Taliban announcing they have reached a tentative agreement for a seven-day reduction in violence, is what they're calling it, a very preliminary step, but one that could eventually affect U.S. troop levels in Afghanistan, America's longest war. So let's get right to ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz. And Martha, you and I have both been to the region. Military leaders have told us a deal with the Taliban was a crucial first step. So how will they measure this so-called reduction in violence? Well, David, here's how it's supposed to work. There will be this seven-day reduction in violence. Don't know how it's measured, but it's a sort of modified truce. If that is successful, the U.S. and Taliban could sign a peace deal that would lead to troop withdrawal. We have more than 12,000 troops there now, but already this year, seven Americans have died, more than 2,300 since the war began. But there is hope tonight, David, that a significant number of American troops could eventually be returning home. David. All right, Martha Raddatz with us. We will stay on this, of course. Thank you, Martha. And next this Friday night, officials in Florida are under fire. After placing a six-year-old in a mental health facility for two days in isolation for 48 hours. Did authorities go too far? The girl's family is now asking for answers tonight, and here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. There is outrage tonight over what's happening here to the six-year-old girl in Jacksonville, Florida, seen in police body camera video that authorities are now releasing. 
Her name is Nadia and she's a child with special needs. She was let out of her school last Tuesday and committed to a mental health facility for two days after the school says she was a threat to herself and others. Her family says they were told she was throwing chairs and having tantrums in class when an outside medical professional made the call to have the child committed. As she's being led away, the girl is calm. She's part because she is fine. In the car, you hear the officers debate the school's decision. I don't see her.